This is number seven in my new Patreon series of the pre-Christian teachings of Jesus, of Yeshua. We're going to look at the evolution of the Kabbalistic Midrash that was used by Yeshua into the later Gentile Christian uh, allegory and typology of the New Testament and then into the second, third century various kinds of Gnostic interpretation that included much more advanced uh, uses of the gematria and other kinds of allegory. So to review the original apocalyptic basor or proclamation, prophetic proclamation, and the proto-Kabbalistic midrash used by Yeshua, uh, he was proclaiming the end of humanity's self-generated bondage to evil. This whole era had passed now, and the advent of a new humanity and a new era uh, of divine sovereignty through self-liberation was, uh, was coming into being. This was his prophetic proclamation. It was not at all uh, like the later Christian gospel or proclamation that Jesus was uh, a deity that should be worshipped. He said, the ancient rule of evil is now passing away and God's rule of justice and divine life among humanity is near. Submit to God, by which he meant to receive the baptism of John, which is a, uh, was, a, was a vow of changing one's lifestyle and, and self-liberating oneself from evil, and keep faith with the basar, with the proclamation. This is the only um, statement we have of Yeshua's original basar, and I put it back into Aramaic, uh, but we find it preserved in Mark's Gospel and the other Gospels, but not understood. So, Yeshua was using a Galilean prophetic moral interpretation of the divine mitzvot or commandments of, of God as predicted and as understood in the prophetic literature as being inscribed in the heart of humanity. The uh, commandments that had to do with justice and compassion and so on and he interpreted them as halakha, a way of living and interacting with others. And this is what uh, he was uh, teaching and exemplifying. This is the kind of thing we find in the prophetic writings about this. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. He's talking about the, uh, the coming of the, the age of Messiah. This is probably the original meaning of Yeshua's teaching that the Malkuth of God is within you. The Aramaic idiom translated within you was in your heart. And like other Galilean uh, Pharisees, Yeshua was opposed to the Judean legalistic halakha, which he called the laws of men, not of God. And uh, we find, for example, another contemporary Galilean Pharisee, Eleazar ben Harkanus, uh, who, like Yeshua, argued that the Jerusalem Sanhedrin Pharisees did not have the authority of God behind their strict legalistic halakha, and like Yeshua, he refused to accept what he called, quote, the traditions of the elders of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, and like Yeshua, Yeshua, he was a native of Nazareth. Another part of the preaching and the teaching of Yeshua was an ap apocalyptic vision of the messianic age on earth but not brought in by great tragedies and uh, great catastrophes as presented in the New Testament which confuse his prophecies about the coming catastrophes for Jerusalem and the temple with an eschatological view of sudden judgment uh, destroying the old world but rather his vision was one of being brought in by the incremental works of spiritually transformed humanity, for example, as in the books of Jubilees and Daniel. It's not a vision, as uh, R.H. Charles uh, 
said in speaking about the the book of Jubilees, which was a, a very different vision of the coming of the Messianic age, and one that was uh, espoused by Yeshua, than we find in Paul and uh, the the Gentile Christians. Uh, as Charles said, it was not a vision of the catastrophic end of the world and divine judgment, but of a transformed and sanctified earth. It is not a pessimistic eschatology or eschatolo eschatological vision, but one like that of the Book of Jubilees previously quoted, in which, quote, the Malkuth would be gradually realized on earth. The word Malkuth un misunderstood by Gentiles in, in their Greek language as kingdom. Yeshua never talked about a kingdom of God. He talked about the Malkuth, which means the sovereignty uh, or the uh, adeptship that would come to realize saints on earth. The sovereignty of God, like the sovereignties of the angels, was a sign of, of spiritual mastery. And he, uh, in which it was said that the Malkuth, the, the, the period of divine sovereignty, within human beings and upon the earth would be gradually realized on earth and the transformation of physical nature would go hand in hand with the ethical transformation of mankind until there was a new heaven and a new earth <clears throat> and thus finally all sin and pain would disappear and mankind would live to the age of a thousand years in happiness and peace and after death enjoy a blessed immortality in the world of God, the spirit world so this was the vision and the view and the preaching and the basis of the teaching and the proto-Kabbalistic Midrash of Yeshua and his teaching. <clears throat> now let's take a look at Christian allegorical mysticism in the New Testament. The early Christians and the Gospel writers employed Yeshua's traditional Midrashic or Kabbalistic Jewish methods of allegory and typology, but unlike Yeshua, they did so totally out of context of the meaning of these things. They use this methodology to tease out non-existent predictions of a crucified Messiah from Jewish scripture and to create nativity and crucifixion resurrection narratives out of thin air from things like uh, Psalm 22 and so on. Uh, here are some statements we find in the Gospel of Luke that show how the early Christians used scripture. It does not, it claims to be given to them from the mouth of the resurrected Jesus, but this is a description of their methods. Supposedly, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that the prophets have spoken. Uh, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Of course, none, none of this is said in the Jewish Old Testament scriptures. It's simply interpreted with out-of-context uh, snippets of, uh, of statements. He then opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So this was the Christian view of how to use the Old Testament scriptures to cherry pick anything they could that seemed to, could be possibly used to predict the idea of a crucified Messiah and so on, none, none of which is in the Old Testament. And uh, they were using, of course, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the translation into the Greek, and even that was being misused. So this was how the allegorical mysticism of the New Testament was, uh, was developed, and that's what appears in the interpretations we find in the Gospels and so on. Now, number letter mysticism originated in the 7th century BC. Uh, they were Pythagorean teachings, and they developed before Jewish Midrashic interpretation was applied to scripture, and it used Greek letters, not Hebrew. But the pre-Christian Jewish sages, probably especially in Babylon, uh, may have applied the Pythagorean tetractus 
to the Tetragrammaton for Genesis emanation. Here's the Tetractus, which is made of 10 parts and emanation from 1 to 10, which is probably the basis for some of the Gnostic emanation schemes. But Hebrew uh, Midrash had um, decided upon emanation as the scheme of Genesis rather than creation as we found in Platonic mysticism that later uh, was basic to Christian understanding of Genesis and so on. And it's quite clear that what we now call Kabbalah, especially the number uh, letter number mysticism of Jewish uh, pre-Christian sages did develop and was influenced by the Pythagorean uh, Greek uh, Kabbalah, so to speak, which is, is known by these uh, that name these days is the Greek Kabbalah, but it pre-existed the, the, the Hebrew Kabbalah and uh, greatly influenced it. And that had been used to some extent in the uh, pre-Christian um, interpretations of Jewish sages, but not to the extent that it later was used by any means or that you find it used in Kabbalah and certainly not in uh, extensively with gematria, which we're going to discuss. <clears throat> now, the Greek Jewish Christian Book of Revelations does extensively employ Greek letter number symbolism. Um, both the Greek and Hebrew letters were used as decimal numbers. Uh, Greek alpha equaled one, and Hebrew aleph equaled one, and so on. The second, third century Gnostic Christians employed Hellenistic Pythagorean number allegories and Hellenistic deity legends to elaborate their emerging theological and Christological concepts of the Lord Jesus, the, uh, the Gnostic revealer. But this had was something that had gone beyond what we find in the New Testament of the first century and certainly uh, had very little connection, no connection really, to the teachings of Yeshua. So in the second century, the numbers 5,000, 50, 12, and 3, and so on, in the gospel narrative of the feeding of the 5,000, which was not a teaching of Yeshua, but a miracle story told about the Christian Jesus, these, these numbers were interpreted by Gnostic Christians as a form of Christian Kabbalah or allegorical mysticism. So by the second to third century, we have a very uh, extensive form of Kabbalistic mysticism and numbers and letters being used uh, to interpret and, and milk more meaning out of what is written in the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, because they're taking stories like the, the feeding of the 5,000 and so on, and they're then applying Kabbalistic numbers to them. Now we're going to take a look at Christian allegories in the New Testament. The Greek and Hebrew letter number correlations were employed by second century Gnostics to dig out hidden secret meanings from New Testament scripture in a process known as gematria, but there's no evidence for gematria in the teachings of Yeshua or the New Testament with the exception of the book of Revelations. <coughs> And the book of Revelations, by the way, uses Greek Pythagorean gematria. Uh, the number of letters that it uses are not the Hebrew letters, but the Greek letters, which is a step removed from both the New Testament and Yeshua. We need to distinguish then between the Christian allegories of the Greek Gospels and the Midrashic allegories in the historical teachings of Yeshua, because they're quite different. For example, the authentic uh, uh, story of Yeshua, which is an allegorical story of the 99 sheep in the Good Shepherd Mashal, or the story of forgiving your brother 70 times 7, uh, that Davar, and so on. These numbers merely represent an idiomatic Semitic way of implying a large number. There's no secret meaning or gematria encoded into the numbers when Yeshua speaks them. He's speaking idiomatically. 
By the same token, a Jewish mashal or davar, as employed by Yeshua, unlike a parable or logian of a Greek philosopher, was not intended to be a point-for-point -point parallel allegory, but simply a forceful way, often hyperbolic way, of emphasizing a point. So that's what we find in the teachings of Yeshua. But as transmitted by the writers of the Greek Gospels, Yeshua's teachings are presented as allegorical parables and philosophical logia in Hellenistic style. And as such, they were redacted by the Gospel writers and other early Christian interpreters to reflect conscious allegorical parallelism, but without Pythagorean numerical symbolism. So we find much later uh, people like uh, David Fiddler, who wrote a book called Jesus Christ, Son of God, Ancient Cosmological and Early Christian Symbolism, speculating about numerical allegories in the feeding of the 5,000. Now, uh, Fiddler is not a biblical scholar. He had a, a doctorate in philosophy and in comparative religion or something like that. So he is, does not really have the credentials to understand this. And he claims and makes the claim that a lot of people do in the modern times that the stories of the New Testament were created by mysterious wise masters in the beginning to indicate solar and astrological symbolism of the Christ. That is simply untrue. That is not how the New Testament was created. That's not how it was written. It's only how he's looking back through the lens of later, basically Gnostic uh, forms of interpretation in order to tease out these meanings from the teachings of Yeshua that have been translated and misunderstood in the New Testament. <coughs> now, by the way, you can prove just about anything using Gematria. Here's one. Uh, here's a number that the writer of this, Bull Baloney, um, says ends all speculations as to the identity of the Antichrist. Uh, and he talks about the number 666, and uh, then he does some uh, gematria magic with that, and he gets letters B, B, O, B, B, O, and he averages the 54-digit string and four names of the Antichrist, he finally ends up proving that President, o President Obama is the Antichrist. You know, this is the kind of way Gematria can be used. It was actually uh, similar to the way it was used by some of the Gnostic schools, and it's also used by all the crazies who are conspiracy theorists today. So let's take a look at number symbolism in the feeding of the 5,000, or actually 5,000 or 4,000, because in Mark, which uh, was written about A.D. 65, was copied around A.D. 85 or 94 into Matthew, Luke, and John, uh, there are two different miracles. There are 5,000 men fasting three days. There are five loaves, two fish, seated in ranks by hundreds and fifties, or hundreds in ranks of 50 in Luke, and 12 small baskets of scraps that are collected, and that thing appears in all four Gospels. However, there's a second feeding in Mark and Matthew only, in which 4,000 people are fasting for three days. There are seven loaves, a few small fish, and 12 large baskets of scraps collected. The later church fathers did not transmit any tradition about the symbolic meaning of the numbers in these, uh, in these parables, but merely speculated in their commentaries. Chrysostom, for example, said the story is a paradox. Uh, he didn't know whether it was the same event or what the numbers really meant, and he wouldn't speculate. But Origen, in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, book uh, 11, speculates that 12 represents the tribes of Israel, 50 represents the year of the Jubilee, when sins are forgiven, etc. Uh, others speculate that 7 represents 70, the traditional number of Gentile nations, and 5 represents the number of letters in the Greek Christian acrostic ichthyos, fish, uh, in Greek, uh, 
the the name meaning Jesus Christos Theu Huias Soter Jesus Christ uh, Son God Son Savior that was the fish acrostic that was later developed as a symbolic uh, uh, metaphor Irenaeus against the heresies uh, um, indicates that Gnostics made extensive use of Greek letter number symbolism to derive their doctrines from scripture and parables like the Good Shepherd and the Feeding of the Multitudes implying that the Proto-Orthodox did not. Now I use the term Proto-Orthodox, I think it's useful. Some scholars today say we shouldn't even talk about a Proto-Orthodox Christianity because they were all just equal branches of uh, of uh, many different forms of Christianity and whether we call them Gnostic or not doesn't matter because they kind of bleed into each other that is true up to a point but there definitely was uh, the the triumphant form of Christianity was uh, it's very le legitimate to call proto orthodox and it certainly existed uh, in the earliest centuries and although there are different brands of Gnosticism and different views of the Gnostics which we will be talking about in our next presentation, uh, uh, that does not uh, uh, do away with the idea that some of the, uh, the traditional church fathers represented what we can call a proto-Orthodox view, one that would, uh, would uh, prevail. <clears throat> In fact, the main interpretation among the early Christian proto-Orthodox commentators was that the feeding of the multitudes was symbolic of the Eucharist, and the fish represented the wine uh, or blood of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, which is probably why the story is told in all four Gospels. It has no gematria. It has no letter number symbolism. That is a later interpretation that we find 2nd, 3rd century Gnostics and so on, and the only interpretation given by later church fathers of the proto-Orthodox bent uh, is simply that uh, there there are probably the numbers relate to something like uh, uh, the twelve tribes of Israel and fifty represents this and so on. But there's no gematria involved, and it doesn't get much more abstruse than that. <coughs> But the 2nd and 3rd century Gnostics used gematria and other Jewish Kabbalistic methods and terms based on Hebrew and Aramaic words. Gnostic traditions claimed secret teachings from the Lord Jesus of the Gospels. They created names for the eons of Gnostic myth that were apparently based on Hebrew angelic and other divine names. These names seem to have been acquired from Greek misspellings of Hebrew angels that were summoned or commanded in Jewish magical and exorcistic rituals, such as those preserved in the Hellenistic Hebrew magical papyri and Sephir Hatsim and so on. Uh, and this is what happened. Uh, people got a hold of written texts and secret information from other uh, sects or other groups and it was highly prized uh, to have this information and so they used they were able to uh, take for example the Jewish name of God which uh, was not pronounced it was in tone but uh, some scholars called Yahweh and they were able to turn that into Greek magical papyri uh, incantations and deities that they would summon and so on they also transmitted creation myths very similar to the Kabbalistic emanation theories developed in earlier Jewish Midrash, but not identical by any means. Valentinus claimed to have learned his emanational system of eons from Thutis, the disciple of Paul, who had been schooled in the Jewish gnosis of sages like Gamaliel. And this line of Pauline interpretation that led to the Marcosian and the Marcionite and Valentis, Valentinian systems was probably historical. And the proto-Gnostic pseudo-Pauline Ephesians and Colossian epistles may have been composed by Thutis, in my opinion. The primary eon in the earliest 
uh, Jewish Christian Gnostic myths was Barbello, who was androgynous and equivalent to the Midrashi coexistent Memra, or voice of God, the preexistent Christ of Philippians, and of the later pseudo Pauline epistles like Ephesians and Colossians and the Johannine Logos. These were uh, ideas that developed early in Jewish Christianity and also the concept of the Memra or voice of God had been developed earlier in pre-Christian uh, among pre-Christian pre Jewish sages uh, and these concepts may underlie things like the Johannine Logos and so on. Barbello seems to have been derived from Aramaic Bar Elohim, Son of God. In any case, Barbello became uh, the primary eon, the, the highest uh, deity in the emanation scheme that was developed in uh, early Gnostic schemes. The Gnostics were accused of stealing and perverting the initiatic Christian Gnosis of the Alexandrian catechetical school, such as those in the lost secret gospel of Mark. While the Proto-Orthodox churches used public Holy Spirit channeling as a basis for religious experience, the Gnostics probably more accurately preserved Yeshua's form of individual religious experience, which was done through private Merkaba Mishkan or Merkaba Ascent that employed meditative forms of mystic ascent into a state of divine gnosis, the Hebrew term manda. And we'll be talking about the uh, work of the chariot for all the way from um, uh, from Yeshua to um, uh, the Gnostics in our next video. Okay, with all that introduction, now is where it gets really interesting. We want to look at how the Gnostics used the Pythagorean number symbols uh, to do their interpretation. And this is this is going to get very interesting and complex. Irenaeus, against heresies, described the letter number system used by the Gnostic Marcos to derive the eonic 10 heavens and 30 eons. Remember... Ten heavens were the ten heavens of Merkaba mysticism that, uh, that we were probably used, part of the system that was used by Yeshua that he, that he taught to his disciples. Uh, the, Valent the Valentinian Pleroma uh, consists of the Agdoad, the Decad, and the Duodecad. The Agdoad is the eighth, the Decad is the ten, and the Duodecad is the twelve, and they add up to thirty eons of emanation from out of Sige, which means silence, is uh, roughly equivalent to another word that was used among the Greeks, which was chaos. And it didn't mean things were in chaotic form. It simply meant it was totally empty, <laughs> total emptiness. So the Agdoad proceeds from <clears throat> silence. And Suge is, by the way, the uh, the being or the consciousness that Marcos channeled in his channelings to receive his teachings. According to Irenaeus, uh, uh, Marcus asserts that the fruit of this arrangement and analogy has been manifested in the likeness of an image, namely him, Jesus, who after six days ascended into the mountains along with three others and then became one of the sixth, or the sixth, in which character he descended and was contained in the hebdomad, since he was the illustrious Agdoad, and contained in himself the entire number of the elements which the descent of the dove, who is Alpha and Omega, made clearly manifest when he came to be baptized, for the number of the dove is 801. Here he's using... Uh, gematria, and the only problem is that the, the, the gematria he's using is Greek. The number of the dove is uh, the word dove in Greek, not in Hebrew. And for this reason did Moses declare that man was formed on the sixth day, and then again, according to arrangement, 
It was on the sixth day, which is the preparation that the last man appeared. The last man appeared for the regeneration of the first. Of this arrangement, both the beginning and the end were formed at that sixth hour at which he was nailed to the tree. So these are interpretations of the New Testament uh, uh, recountings of ahistorical events. For that perfect being, nous, nous is the Greek word meaning higher consciousness, probably equivalent to Hebrew chaya, uh, the, the mind of the neshama. For that perfect being, nous, uh, and remember Paul also says, I'd rather speak one word with my five words or something with my nous than the thousand, babble a thousand in tongues and so on. For that perfect being, Nous, knowing that the number six had the power both of formation and regeneration, declared to the children of the light that regeneration which has been brought out by him who appeared as the Episimon in regard to that number. Whence also he declares it is that the double letters contain the Episimon number, for this Episimon which, when joined to the 24 elements, completed the name of 36 letters, what is he talking about? What is this episimon? Well, episimon is an obsolete Greek letter which resembles an F or an S, and it was used in Pythagorean gematria to represent the sacred tetractus. Uh, the, we look at the Greek numerals. This is the episimon. If you know any Greek, you'll know that that number and that letter does not exist anymore. It's not used. Uh, by the convention of gematria, one unit, known as a kolel, may be added or subtracted from the value of any word without affecting its symbolic meaning. For example, the tree of life, the zulon zoe, a symbol of Hebrew mysticism, has a numerical value of 1625. Its Greek equivalent is the tetractus or tetractage uh, 1626. This is uh, how uh, the the, the uh, Hellenistic uh, Jewish sages may have derived their concept of the tetractus that I showed you earlier. This is the mathematical tetractus that was a sacred symbol to the Pythagoreans. It was the generation of 10 from 1, and uh, it was known as the tetractus, and it really becomes the basis for emanational theories of the Gnostics. It may have been also the same for Hebrew concepts of emanation as opposed to Christian ideas of creation. He, now speaking of Valentinus, according to uh, Irenaeus, Valentinus employed as his instrument as the Sige primordial silence or channeled instructor of Marcos declares, the power of seven letters in order that the fruit of the independent will of Akamoth, which is probably from the Hebrew Chachma wisdom, might be revealed. In other words, Valentinus uh, employed uh, uh, the power of seven letters in order that the fruit of Akamoth might be revealed. And the Sige, or primordial silence, or the channeled instructor of Marcos, was the one who brought forth this concept of the seven letters. Now, the seven letters are actually the seven powerful vowels in Greek. In Hebrew, there are no vowel letters for vowels. There are simply later, they were simply a system of markings that were brought in for vowels. Uh, you had to memorize what the vowels were. But in Greek, the vowels had names, and they were called the seven powerful vowels. And they happened to be the seven sounds that are created from the highest to the lowest the vibrations in harmonic intoning. Uh, the seven powerful vowels of the, cre of the Ephesian grammata, the, the uh, Ephesian uh, letters, which were used by magicians and so on, represented as a Zodian or a living being, as a deity, uh, known as Damnameneos. <laughs> it was roughly equivalent to the English 
yeah, yeah, which is yeah, which is the qualifying of vowels for intoning magical, uh, magical chants. Now he goes on to say, consider this present episimon, she says, him who is formed after the episimon is being, as it were, divided or cut into two parts and remaining outside, who by his own power and wisdom through means of that which had been produced by himself, in other words, he was uh, self-generating, gave life to this world consisting of seven powers, the seven powerful vowel sounds, after the likeness of the power of the hebdomad, the seventh reality, and so formed it that it is the soul of everything visible, and he indeed uses this work himself as if it had been formed by his own free will, but the rest, as being images of what cannot be imitated, are subservient to the enthymesis, which means the reflection of the mother. Uh, and then we're getting into a lot of stuff uh, that's pretty deep here. The mother is the is inseminated by the father and generates, but all these beings who generate things or bring things into existence are really aspects of consciousness, are insisages or male-female pairs because they generate things out of themselves, and the concept of generation is through the action of a male or female. But the highest form of being is a single being who is... Uh, able to generate out of itself, and the term in Greek was the uh, the out the autogenes, the self generator, the highest form of Godhead. And the first heaven, which is the Enochian Hebrew tenth heaven or throne of God, indeed pronounces Alpha, the next to this Epsilon, the third Eta, the fourth, which is also in the midst of the heaven, utters the sound of Iota the fifth Omicron, the sixth Upsilon, the seventh, which is also the fourth from the middle, utters, utters the elegant Omega as the Sige of Marcos, talking a great deal of nonsense, says Irenaeus, but uttering no word of truth, confidently asserts, and these powers, she adds, being all simultaneously clasped in each other's embrace, do sound out the glory of him by whom they were produced, and the glory of that sound is transmitted upwards to the propater. The propater is the original generator, the original. And this term father means actually uh, father-mother. She, Sige, asserts, that is the, uh, the muse uh, that is channeled by Marcos, moreover that the sound of this uttering of praise having been wafted to the earth has become the framer and parent uh, of those things which are on the earth in other words it is through this sound that things are generated now where have we heard this before well we've heard it in hinduism we've heard it in vedic philosophy aum the primordial word of god so we can see that the Gnostics had, in this case, an interesting connection with Hindu thought, of Vedic thought, as supposedly Pythagoras did. And, in fact, there are many, many, many more connections between Gnostic and uh, Vedic or, or Hindu philosophical thought uh, than just these. But we won't try to go through them in this presentation. However, I do want to take a look at the divine word Iao, which we find in the Greek magical papyri uh, that was used for Gnostics in harmonic intoning. It happens to be the first half of the, of the name of God in Hebrew, which is Yahweh. And it was known and used by uh, magicians and others for bringing things into manifestation from the divine world into the lower world. Yeah. Like this. So, so he says, the father of the great light who came forth from the silence, he is the great doxomedon eon. 
which means the Lord of glory, which is perhaps a version of the uh, concept of the Father of lights, which we find in the Epistle of James. Now remember, the Epistle of James and the Epistle of Jude are the only traditions that are attributed at all to the brothers of Yeshua and that contain, uh, although in, in quite uh, redacted form, uh, some of the ideas of Yeshua, such as James, who says that faith without works is dead, because the Hebrew word for faith was amuna, which meant faithfulness or perseverance, and there were people that were advocating that mere belief, faith meant belief in the Greek world, pistis, uh, all you had to do is believe and everything would be good. No, and yet, and James says, no, that's not true. That belief without works is useless, and so on. But these two, the, in the uh, in the Epistle of Jude and the Epistle of James, uh, contain pro perhaps some uh, some uh, relevant information that is preserved from the teachings of Yeshua and his thought world, and this idea of the Father of Lights, which in Gnostic view becomes Doxomedon, Doxomedon Eon, the Doxomedon Eon, in which the thrice male child rests, and the throne of his glory was established in it. This one on which his unrevealable name is inscribed on the tablet. One is the Word, the Father of the light of everything, he who came forth from the silence. While he rests in the silence, he whose name is from an invisible symbol. A hidden invisible mystery came forth. And here's what uh, we are told this mystery was. Along a whole series of iotas, a whole series of epsilons, of omegas, of upsilons, of epsilons again, except it's a, it's the long epsilon, and the the alpha, and the long o, the omega, these are sounds. These are the seven magical vowels, the seven vowels that are uh, in that are intoned seven twenty-two times each, and uh, they go basically like this. And this is the sound that is used to generate manifestation from what the Hebrews would have called the world of Yetzirah, or the world of formation, into the visible world of manifestation, Asiya. And in this way, we're told, the three powers gave praise to the great, invisible, unnameable, virginal, uncallable spirit and his male virgin, and they asked for a power. A silence of living silence came forth, namely glories and incorruptions in the eons, uh, eons, myriads, added on, the three males, the three male offsprings, the male races, and uh, so on and so on, and filled the great doxomedon eon with the power of the word of the whole Pleroma. So, uh, this is the kind of uh, way that uh, magical, shamanic, uh, Pythagorean uh, forms of number mysticism and uh, uh, magical intoning that we find in the magical papyri and other esoteric things were uh, put together by the Gnostics as, and uh, we don't have many of the writings uh, and certainly not anything as esoteric as we've just got found from Irenaeus, but uh, that's what was being taught, and uh, it's uh, it's very fascinating material. Uh, here we have a zodian of the Gnostic Marcos, uh, which is made totally out of the letters of the Greek alphabet, and it represents wisdom as the word of God as a Greek Gnostic Alpha Omega Christ or Sophia wisdom. And that means that the creative word of God is, uh, is, a, is, is a magical thing that brings things into manifestation. 
So what I want to do now is I want to compare Yeshua's Midrash, his Kabbalistic ideas, to Christian interpretation in the New Testament, and then as it's developed by Gnostic interpretation in different forms of Gnosticism. And um, I want to show that later, when I do another video, that there is an interesting continuity between the Kabbalah of Yeshua and the Kabbalah of the Gnostics that was not included in the literature we have of the so-called Proto-Orthodox Christianity, but was among the Gnostics. So in Yeshua's Midrash, as we can review, uh, he was a Galilean prophetic, uh, he was a Galilean sage and a prophet, and he used Galilean prophetic moral interpretation of the divine commandments inscribed in the heart, justice, compassion, interpreted as halakha, a way of living and interacting with others, as we discussed. And, he, and his halakha was a halakha of divine rebirth, of rebirth into a new humanity, a new human archetype. It was, he was opposed, and it was opposed, to the Judean legalistic halakha, which were considered to be the laws of men, not of God. And his vision was an apocalyptic or a revelationary vision of the Messianic age, not an eschatological vision of the violent end of the world, but a Messianic age on earth brought in by the incremental works of spiritually transformed humanity, as in the books of Jubilees and Daniel. And this was his proclamation, was that it was now the time for the end of humanity's self-generated bondage to evil and to bring in the advent of divine sovereignty through self-liberation, where humanity itself would become the steward of uh, uh, and exercise the powers of Godhead. In New, Te New Testament interpretation, we have the Pauline salvation Christology. Jesus was the Passover Lamb of God, a divine sacrifice to atone for the sins of all who would believe in his righteousness. So uh, it's, it's uh, Paul does not transmit teachings of Yeshua. He, ta he transmits his theology and Christology about the divine Jesus. Uh, he did this in order to counter the Judean Pharisaic claim that Jesus was a criminal because he was allegorically hung upon a tree. And so he used uh, rabbinic ways of countering these rabbinic objections. Uh, and he put forth the, the idea that was not supported by the teachings of Yeshua that uh, Yeshua was a Davidic Messiah. Yeshua spoke against the Davidic Messiah. He was, uh, he was a proponent of the Bar Enosh Messiah, which entirely, is entirely different. The new archetype of humanity Messiah, not one person, but a whole people, uh, a corporate being. But in Paul's teaching, Jesus is the Davidic Messiah who, according to an eschatological interpretation of certain apocalyptic writings, would return to judge the world in a second coming. Again, nothing that Yeshua was teaching. And he also taught that the Jews crucified their own Savior, Messiah, and that Jesus condemned Judaism and founded a new Israel, that is, Christianity. This was not Paul's teaching, these last two were not actually Paul's teachings, but the way Paul's teachings were then developed and uh, in New Testament interpretation. Now if we look at the Gnostic allegories that came later in the 2nd, 3rd century, uh, the earliest of these uh, actually is from the Gospel of Thomas, which does preserve 80% of it, uh, an Aramaic core that is, reflects the actual teachings of Yeshua, but there are many of them are Kabbalistic teachings that are not found in the New Testament or independent teachings uh, of uh, what the New Testament calls parables and sayings, but what were in fact devarim and uh, and and, and um, uh, the kind of stories that were told by sages to make a point, uh, mashalim and so on. We find in the Gospel of Thomas, but they've been gnosticized. They've been uh, spun just like the sayings of Yeshua were spun in the New Testament Gospels to reflect their ideas. 
same in the Gospel of Thomas, they have to be unspun. But basically in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus reveals the path to Christhood for male souls through Gnosis. And what do we mean by male souls? Well, uh, the only complete soul that was capable of regeneration was a male soul. That's why in an, an, an inauthentic statement, the last, the last uh, Logian we find in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, uh, Peter objects to Mary Magdalene's presence and uh, because she's not a male so she cannot become uh, you know divine and Yeshua says yes but I will make her male and then she will become one of you and so on. So this is a, a, a concept that existed. The, the original Thomas Christians were uh, probably ascetic males in the Gospel of John, which is uh, the, is quite proto-Gnostic and provides a lot of fodder for the Gnostics, Jesus is a redeemer. He's a divine logos incarnate. And belief in him leads to spiritual rebirth and power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. So this is the way that Gnostic allegory is uh, spun uh, by the end of the first century and getting into the second century in the Valentinian Gnosis, the Old Testament God demanded righteousness, but who was not a God of the divine revealer, Jesus. Now, he was not evil. He was a God of righteousness, but he's not the highest God. Baptism, Gnosis, and bridal chamber were necessary for spiritual rebirth as a Christic, as we find in other Valentinian documents like the Gospel of Philip and so on. In Marcion and the other Gnostics, the Old Testament God was an evil lower deity. He was the enemy of humanity, and correct gnosis was necessary in order to, in order to get released from uh, imprisonment by him. He's uh, essentially equivalent to Haimar Mene, or destiny, or fate, or the uh, what was called in some systems the executioners, the lower deities, the what what uh, Paul referred to as the archons uh, who uh, under whose power we all were until we became divine. So please click on the Patreon link in my description just below the video and become a patron to help sponsor my new videos on the pre-Christian teachings. Uh, my next video will deal with uh, Merkaba mysticism with the work of the chariot all the way from its original uh, presentations in the teachings of Yeshua to the second third century Gnostic ideas. Thank you for watching.